This is William to knock talk Kingsland, Texas, and also in Jakarta, Indonesia, our beloved Rabbi Tobias Singer. Who do we have on the phone? Um, this is Brian Rothman from Miami. Brian, thank you for calling. Thank you for calling. Do you have a question for our lovely rabbi today? I, I do. Rabbi, why do Jews not say the name of God, Yud K, Vav K? But Christians seem to be taught that it's okay to say God's name. Mm. Are only Jews not allowed to speak the name of Hashem? Okay. Oh, wow. You know That's what? I've never even question. considered that question. I've heard that, that sacred name thing in the movement all along. Right? But, you know, I've never, I've never thought about that. Is it okay for a Christian or a, an Islam or somebody like that to actually say the word? And is, is it only forbidden for the Jew? That's great. That's great. That's a great question, Brian. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, you. If you want to, uh, you can just disconnect and listen for your answer. You'll hear it in about 29 seconds. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Hey, Thanks again. Yeah, great, yeah. great question. Thanks for the call. That's a, that's a fabulous question. Um, let me first answer the question, and that is that although uh, many of the listeners and viewers of this show know that uh, all every person, the Torah says, is creating the image of God, and therefore those people who are not Jewish uh, have seven Noahide laws. And many people say, object and say, what do you mean seven Noahide laws? We don't believe in that. But as it turns out, if you look in the Torah, you'll see that uh, the nations of the world are all commanded to live their lives in a very special way. And uh, if there were no seven Noahide laws, then what did the people do wrong in Genesis 6? That the God should bring a flood. So therefore, uh, now the seven Noahide laws are not individual distinct laws like the 613 commandments uh, that, are, that the Jewish people are bound by, but rather there are seven categories of laws. And one of those categories is that it is forbidden that a, a, a person who is a person must worship the one God of Israel. It's forbid, forbidden to commit an act of blasphemy. And it's forbidden for any person to say the name of God, anyone, Jew or Gentile. And I'm going to surprise you a little bit more. Of course, in, by the way, I'll shock you even more. This essentially is the only in the Torah, really, the only unforgivable sin. The Torah says, only with regard to this sin in the entire scripture, if you go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, so the Torah says that it is, this is a very, very severe commandment. He says that a person, Lysisa, has shame Hashem Lashov. It is forbidden for anyone to take, to raise up God's name in vain. And God will not forgive. I don't know what your translations say, but actually the Torah says, if you violate that commandment, I will, God will not forgive you. And, I, and people ask me all the time, in fact, this past Shabbat in Jakarta, we had many, many people there, and people were very curious about this. Because as it turns out, if you look at the Ten Commandments, you could very clearly see that certain command, the earlier commandments are primary. So, I am the Lord your God. You, if you don't get that right, you're pretty much in, you know, then what's the point? And then we see that the, there's a commandment not to add another God on top of God. That's worse than spouting down to statues and graven images. But we see that later on in the Ten Commandments, there is a very serious prohibition against swearing falsely in the name of God. That's forbidden. But you know, at that commandment, that negative commandment, it doesn't say God won't forgive you if you do that. Not only that, there is a, a prohibition in the Torah. Uh, where we are told that it's forbidden to curse God. It's forbidden to curse God's name. But as it turns out, it didn't even, that did not even make it to the Ten Commandments. I'm not suggesting that these are not very serious sins. They are grave sins. But taking God's name in vain is, 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 one of, is essentially one of the worst things a person can do. And the question is, why? Because it seems counterintuitive. It seems logical. All right, it's not a good thing to be blabbling God's name all over the place. But it seems like logic would suggest that it should be much worse to curse God 
it should be a much grave, a much graver sin to swear falsely name of God than just to say his name in vain, just to say it when it's not permissible. And we see, in fact, that Tyro warns us very severely. I encourage the viewers of this show to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 58, and we are warned very carefully, do not in any way, God forbid, don't ever be, you have to, you have to honor and give, be very fearful this great and holy name of, of God. Very, very careful. So, so the question is why? Why is it that taking God's name in vain, saying God's name, and there was, there was a time like when the high priest went into the Holy Holies on Yom Kippur, he did use the name of God, but why then it was permitted, but why is it worse? It, it doesn't make, seem, at, at first glance, it seems like, you know, it should be like, don't curse God, that should be way in the beginning. You know, it should be, don't swear falsely in God's name. Don't, you know, say bad things about God, that should be all the way in the beginning. Maybe God's name in vain, that prohibition should be towards the end, but it's not that way. The question is, why is this? Why is this just a great, why is this such a, what are you doing when, when, when someone says God's name in vain? Why is, it so, why is it so grievous? Why is it spiritually so damaging? Why does it harm someone's relationship with God so grievously? Now, I should mention one caveat before I enter here, and that is that, of course, a person who doesn't know and doesn't understand is not held accountable for what they do wrong. God only holds someone accountable for what they understand. And if I will say this to you, if you plan to keep using God's, saying God's name in vain, it's better to turn the show off right now, because it's better for you not to understand. So obviously we're not talking about people who, who don't understand. Most people don't know how to pronounce God's name. They use all kinds of mispronunciations. But it's only for those who do it in tension. The question is why... Why does the Torah consider this such a severe sin? Why does the Torah say specifically here that God will not forgive those who, who raise up God's name in vain? Why? Why is it even more than what we find with falling, swearing falsely? It should be. Logic would, would dictate, I think, uh, that swearing falsely in the name of God, that should be. It should say that don't swear falsely in the name of God, and I will not forgive you if you do that. But it doesn't say that. Okay, so, you know, one of the things that I've shared with you in the past is that we are all created in the image of God. I remember uh, having a conversation with an atheist, and he said to me, look, I don't need the Torah or your Ten Commandments to tell me not to steal or not to kill. I know on my own that it's wrong. I don't need the Torah, I don't need your Bible, I don't need your God to tell me. I know it's wrong. I don't, what do you think? So, one of the things I, I explained right away, which, I, which shocked him, was that, as it, as it turns out, that when, when the Jewish people received the Torah at Mount Sinai, and we heard the commandment, don't murder, we didn't go, really? Don't murder? Whoever would have thought of that? Give a look at that. That's a nice leper. It was the Torah says, uh, don't steal, right? And we went, really? You can't steal? No, it, it made sense to us immediately. It resonated with us. Why? Because we are created in the image of God. This is why people who say they're atheists or agnostics, they also are normally repelled by murder and by theft and by other kinds of all sorts of sins. And the reason is that atheists are also created in the image of God. They're, they're sinning by turning their back on Him, or they may be ignorant of the relationship with Him, whatever it is, but... Every human being is creating the image of God. And to demonstrate this to you, uh, think about the dog and cat, your pet, that you love so much. You know, your cat that you adore, that you love, you kiss, you feed it, you, your dog is your best friend, is your sister, is your best, the best thing that ever happened. As it turns out, cats and dogs and, and all these creatures that you love commit murder, uh, rape, and theft every single day. And it's not, they don't even know they're doing anything wrong. They have no clue. They, it doesn't even occur to them that it's wrong to murder, it's wrong to take food that belongs to another cat, this cat's, this, this cat's food, this dog's bone. Why do dogs bury their bone and they try to hide their bone? Because they're afraid another dog will come around and take it. 
Why don't they think that maybe someone wouldn't, another dog wouldn't do it? Because they're not creating the image of God. They're not aware of Hashem. What I'm, what I'm seeking to convey to you is something very deep, and you need to listen very, very carefully. That in fact, we, because we are, we have the same voltage of God. That means there's a divine spark in each and every one of us. Our neshama, our soul can never die. It's a, a divine spark. It's a reflection of Hashem. And therefore, we are naturally receptive and our, our, our spiritual mind comports, matches the voltage of Torah of God. Automatically. The commandments make complete sense to us, although they make no sense to cats and dogs. And we love dogs. We, we adore them. But... They have no idea. There's no other animal in the world that ever believed in God. As intelligent as dolphins are, how, how, as wonderful it is to be, on a, to be diving somewhere in the Red Sea or in the uh, Indian Ocean and to encounter dolphins, perhaps the most intelligent animals in the world, they, no dolphin ever believed in God. So therefore, listen very carefully, Therefore, we can actually use our own uh, spiritual sense as barometer for right and wrong. Now, consider this for a moment. It is very likely that you, or maybe your brother, your sister, your siblings, got into a fight with your mother one time, right? And sometimes you hear a child say to his mother, Mommy, I hate you, right? You may hear your sister say it, you know, I know it's hard to believe, but mothers and daughters have fought. There is such a concept that happened once or twice. But sometimes when children, they, they argue with their parents, they fight, I hate you, you're the worst mommy, you're the f- daddy, I hate you, you're the worst daddy it ever was, I hate you. You're the- Terrible fights happen. In fact, I would, I would, um, I, my guess is that probably you've had some of your biggest fights, not with strangers, not with a cashier in Walmart, but rather with the people who are closest to you. So it's very likely in your life, or certainly the people close to you, you've seen your siblings, or you may have said terrible things to your parents in your life. You may have said something terrible to your father, and maybe you regret it today. But, but one thing you probably have not done, interestingly, and that is... And even in the heat of a fight, in, where you're very, very angry at your mother, or you're very angry at your father, would you ever call your father by his first name? Think about that. And, I, you know, William, think about that. I'm not asking you personally, but we'd like to know. But on a serious note, have you ever called your father by your first name? And if you heard your brother call your mother by her first name, what would you do? If your sister got into a fight with your mother, you try to calm things down, make peace in the house, come on, and this, you tr- maybe try to do that. But you, you, you understand that, you know, family fights happen, right? But if, my guess is that if you ever heard your brother address your father by his first name, I think you would pull him aside and say, don't ever do that. What happened? What's going on? Why, if you hear your brother arguing with your father, oh, they're fighting again. But if your brother would ever dare call your father by his first name, there's something inside of you would shatter. So you see something unbelievable here. We see that we are, that this is seared into our spiritual consciousness, that calling your own father, who is also a cre- your creator, Calling your own father by his first name is something that most people would never dare do. They would say, Daddy, you're bad. Or they would lie to their parents. Kids lie to their parents all the time. <laughs> but, or they would say, Mommy said I can have a cookie. Lying completely. But to go actually and call your mother by her first name, if you heard your sister do that, you'd be shocked. And it's very likely, I'm guessing, that you might say to your sister, that's not, that's, that really is, you've crossed the line. The question is why? What is happening? Because we see this empirically, this is true. We see that, I think many of the listeners, many of the viewers of this show, you got into a fight with your parents, it happened, but you probably never ever addressed your mother and said her name. 
You never talked to her and said, and called her by her first name. You never called your father by his first, first name. That is a line you would not cross. The question is why? What is so horrible? So you see how delicious the tire is. You see that the, the Ten Commandments is tuning into something that we all naturally, empirically apprehend. And Jews and non-Jews, are, we're all creating the image of Hashem. Hashem is our Father. We have only one Father and nothing else. So therefore, it is, the, it is in some measurable way that is tangible, that we could see empirically, it is the worst thing you can do, is calling your own father by his first name. You might have fought with him, you might have said, I hate you, Daddy, whatever. First name, that's too far. The question is why, in fact, do we see that with our Heavenly Father and with our biological father? Why is this? So the question is, why is it so grievous to call your father, let's take your, your human father, why is it such a terrible thing to address, to talk to your mother and call her by her first name? Why is it so grievous to address your father in the heat of an argument and call him by his first name? What are you really doing? When you call your father by his, his first name, what you're really doing is, you're saying, you're not my father anymore. You are irrelevant. That's what you're saying. If you're fighting, if you're arguing, if you're saying it's a bad thing, and certainly it is forbidden to curse your own parents, it's forbidden in the Torah, it's a grave sin, and one must repent of that and ask their parents for forgiveness, and every child of God should ask their parents to forgive them for, for what they've done and what they've said. But once you cross that line, and you call your father by his first name, what you're really saying is you're just not relevant anymore. You're not my father, because that's what you're really saying. Because a, a child does not call his mother by her name. No one, no child will go, Debbie, I hate you. That they wouldn't say. It's mommy, I hate you, but not Debbie. Why? Because once you say Debbie, once you call your mother Debbie, once you call, call your mother Christina, or whatever her name, whatever you call her name, once you do that, you're saying you're not my mother anymore. We're totally, our relationship is completely severed. We are divorced. You're not my father anymore. It's not that we're, we are fighting. It's that there is no fight. In fact, you'll see that in, in marriages, in other, all sorts of relationships, when, when people fight with each other, whether it be spouses or brothers and sisters or family members or friends, if I... When people are fighting, it means that there's a relationship. And we're fighting because whatever, we feel hurt or angry. But when marriages disintegrate completely and there really is nothing left, they just, it's sort of the fighting stops. It's like it's not even, you're not even relevant anymore. It's over. Now, all the other names of God that we have in the Torah, and there are many of them, those other names of God we do use never in vain but we do use in, in prayer that we do, because those are all really dis, much more just descriptions of God. After all, we have a limited mind. God is the infinite. These names are for us to just understand uh, the nature of Hashem. Elikim means God is all-powerful, and so on. Um, and all the other names have are really attributes of God. So therefore, one should be very, very careful one other point, I want to say this to the listeners. I want you to listen like you've never listened in your life. I'm going to share with you a very important principle. We see in, in the Jewish scriptures that there are hundreds and hundreds of messianic prophecies that were uttered thousands of years ago to generations who would not live to see the Mashiach. They would resurrect, but they wouldn't live to see it. And the question is, why was it important to Isaiah's generation to hear about the Mashiach who was going to come so much later, thousands of years later. So whenever we look at Messianic passages, we're, we're, most people think, well, we're learning about the future. Most people, when they encounter a verse in Scripture that is describing the Messianic age, most people say, oh, this is what's going to happen, you see? But actually there's something much more important, because in the Messianic age, what we find is that the world is in a state of perfection. That's really what the Messianic Age is, that the world achieves a perfect state. And therefore, what we see 
in each and every messianic prophecy is really in a, a, a picture, a moving portrait of what the world should be like in any given time. In any given time, there should be peace in that war. In any given time, all the world should praise the God of Israel and no other name. And every tongue should, should bless him and praise him alone. And every knee should bow to him. It's not just in the Messianic age. And therefore, my holy brothers and sisters, listen very carefully. The prophets tell us that in the Messianic age, what's going to happen? The non-Jews are going to come to the Jewish people and they're going to grab the shirt of a Jew. Zechariah 8.23 and I'm going to say, take us with you, teach us about God because now we know that God is with you. Jeremiah 16, 19 and 20. They're going to say, we may teach us about Hashem. They're going to come because that's the role of the Jew. The role of the Jewish people, listen like you've never listened in your life. The, not, when I say the Jewish people, I don't mean all the Jews and many of them who are not. I'm talking about the role of the Jewish people who have undertook the covenant of God is to be a priestly nation. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6, right before the Ten Commandments. So therefore, if we see in the Messianic age that the nations of the world, the non-Jews of the world, are going to come to the Jews to learn about the God of Israel and to know how to worship God properly, what does that mean? Does that mean that's only something that should occur only in the future? No. It's, it's a message to every single person who's not Jewish, that if you want to know what's right, you want to know what's correct, Go to the Jewish people, not any of the Jews, but go to those who are faithful, those who come. Because if the Jewish people are telling you that the seventh day is Shabbos, and they're saying to you, don't say that name, and they're saying, this is what the film looked like, listen to them. Listen to the children of Israel, because the covenant was given to them. And you see that the, the Bible says, Scripture tells us, that the nations will come to the Jews for truth. That means that... For, Therefore, I, I say this to you, if somebody tells you anything, let's, let's set aside taking God's name in vain. If somebody tells you something about God, any idea, and it is against everything that the, that the children of Israel believe for thousands of years, this is a very serious problem. You should treat any such claims, any of these utterances, any of these ideas that the Jewish people reject with great suspicion. You should look at what do the Jewish people teach, what, what who, God has preserved those Jews who have kept the covenant, the Jews who have abandoned the covenant of God. They're lost. They assimilated. They're not here among us today. God has preserved those Jews who have kept the written and oral Torah and rejected all the ideas of all the other nations in the world. And all the heretical sects that have emerged from Judaism, they've almost, they largely disappeared completely. Therefore, it is a very good idea for every person, every child of God, to look at the Jewish people. And if somebody puts an idea and puts forward an idea and it's against everything the Jewish people are teaching and conveying, then you should treat it with very great caution and great, great suspicion. But yes, taking God's name in vain means that you're saying, you're not my father anymore. You're irrelevant. And, that's, and that means it's not that God's really saying that I won't forgive you. What's really happening, God's saying, then we have no relationship. You understand? Then it's over. So you know that there's one God, you know it, but you're saying uh, you're not relevant. There were groups like that. There were, mm, the word cynic is used is a, actually there was a, a religious philosophical movement called the cynics. And they actually, they believe that there was this God, he created the world and he went to sleep and he's not interested in what you say, what you pray, he's not involved in your life, we don't want anything to do with him either. That's what a person does when they say God's name in vain. And no person, Jew or Gentile, should ever utter the shame hamafarish, the full letter word, the, the tetragrammaton, that should never be uttered on the lips of any person. Unless it's prescribed, the Torah, and go to the Jewish people and ask them. If someone tells you, if somebody in, in Oklahoma says, do something, <laughs> don't, just, and if you'll ask, of course, you go to Scripture, Go to Deuteronomy 28, verse 58. Read Exodus chapter, and you see that taking God's name in vain is before everything, before ev before swearing falsely, the, the 
cursing God is in the, even in the Ten Commandments, and so on. So obviously, this is a very, very serious matter, which most people don't understand. Adon olah, asher malach, v'terem kol yetzir nivra, v'et nasa, v'chev tzokol, אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמוני